let's get into your time in Seattle. Okay. I want to hear, hear that experience. Mm -hmm. When you were first, uh, you were traded over there from mm -hmm. the Red Sox. Yep. So walk me through that initial trade. At the time, they were in the Kingdom. You started the game, the inaugural game at Safeco mm -hmm. Field. Yep. I'm sure you know how much of a pitcher-friendly ballpark, T-Mobile Park, Safeco is now in Seattle. At least it's known in the big pitcher leagues. Pitcher-friendly? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now? Yeah. Today? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't call it pitcher-friendly. That's, th that's... I think when we first moved in there, it was. Okay. The ball, I think, you know, people talk about, and again, this is way over my head, but uh, barometric pressure and the cement. They call it the marine layer. Yeah. It's where this, yeah, the yeah. sea air comes uh, yeah, in. Sometimes it, then yeah. the ball doesn't carry as right. well. But I also believe, too, that when it's warm there, the ball jumps out of that ballpark. Okay. I really do. But I, I you know, so when we, well, let me, let me, let's, let's go back. To the trade. That'll be, yeah. yeah. The, part two is. We'll talk about that. Um, uh, when I got traded, I was actually really excited. Um, in Boston, you know, when I signed with Boston that off season, they said, "Look, you know, we don't know what you're going to do for us." And I ended up being the sixth man in a five man rotation and the seventh man in a six man bullpen. <laughs> I didn't realize I was kind of floating. Yeah. Right. I got a couple spot starts. Uh, but I was basically the long man in the bullpen, and I wanted to start because that's what I did mm -hmm. basically my whole career. And um, you know, we had Roger Clemens on that staff. So what I did, because I, you know, I prepared to start spring training, and I actually started, we, if, if you go back and look at that season, we started that season 0-4, I believe I started the fifth game, and we, we won our first game when there I you started. Go. You know, so I'm like, hey. And then I went right back to the bullpen, right? So, yeah, that, that it just wasn't, you know, they were trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. So I took it upon myself when the day that Roger Clemens started, he was going to throw 150 pitches. Jeez. It didn't matter. Yeah, He was throwing 150 pitches. That's the kind of warrior he was, right? So I'm like, okay, well, if he's going to throw 150 pitches, he's not going to throw those in the first five innings probably. So I'm going to use that as my bullpen day, as if I was a starting pitcher. Mm -hmm. So I'd throw a long bullpen that day and kept my fingers crossed <laughs> that I didn't get in that game. And uh, so let's move now to the trading deadline. I get traded to Seattle, and I walk in the door, and the club's in Milwaukee, and basically Lou says, here's the ball. You're going to start. Now, I've seen a lot of times where a guy might be a bullpen guy and get traded and become a starter, and he goes, well, I'm not ready. I need mm -hmm. a week or two weeks to you know, get my And I was like, thank you. I took the ball, and I started for the rest of the season. Had a fairly decent you know, rest of the season, and uh, impress them enough to, you know, to have an opportunity to be a starter the next year. And I feel like I took the ball and ran with it. But, uh, you know, somebody to show that kind of confidence in me was what I needed. Uh, on that side of things, knowing that I needed to do the bulk of the work on my side. Mm -hmm. Because now I had, again, another opportunity. Like yeah. I told you, I, you know, I got a lot of opportunities in my career. So... You know, I was old enough to understand that, hey, this might be your last opportunity. So I, I took it as that, and I looked looked upon it as that, and that's exactly what I did. And, uh, you know, again, like I said, when I came to Seattle, things were starting to move forward. Yeah. So that was something I hadn't really ever experienced in my career at that point either. Mm -hmm. So it was exciting times. Um, I love pitching in the kingdom. People hated the kingdom. The only thing I didn't like about being in the kingdom was that on the beautiful sunny days, you know, you were in there all day long yeah. and didn't get to enjoy the wonderful weather. Other than that, I love the kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, and I didn't mind it coming in as an opponent. And I came in as an opponent, and I felt like I had a, a, a decent amount of success. Um, so when I came to Seattle, you know, it was not an issue for me. 
what do you call the King Dome? Hitter friendly, pitcher friendly? Oh, in, definitely in hitter friendly. Hitter friendly? Definitely, especially right field. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in the turf. Right. So the field was a lot quicker. Balls are flying right? off yeah. the turf. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed pitching in Seattle, enjoyed pitching in the King Dome. And then, yeah, I, had, I was fortunate enough to be handed the ball to pitch the first game uh, in what was then Safeco Field. Um, we lost that game 3-2, to two, but uh, it was against the Padres. It was a good game. Uh, I think Jose, unfortunately, the end of the game, Jose Mesa blew that lead. Um, but it was a, a very memorable day. Uh, and I was honored to have that, that opportunity to, to be that guy. Um, but yeah, you know, moving forward then, you know, I, I, you know, and again, I, I only know this from using my ears, the hitters used to complain, you know, the ball doesn't carry here, you know, now look, you're going from across the street in the kingdom, <laughs> right. To now you're playing outdoors. You've got weather, right. you know, the fog, you know, mm -hmm. the dampness, the coolness, um, you know, and then people want to even as far as saying, you know, the cement was dry, but it mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, they said just the air was heavy mm -hmm. and the ball didn't carry. Now, when they closed the roof, I think the ball carried better. Even though it's an open air mm -hmm. roof. Yeah. Interesting. So, and the, uh, there were times where there was some wind in there as well because it was open, but you know, wonderful ballpark. Mm -hmm. Wonderful Beautiful. ballpark. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a, you know, there was a time where there was a struggle with the, the backdrop when we first moved in, the hitter's eye. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a glare at certain times of the year, certain times of the day. There's a glare for not only the hitters, it was the catcher and the umpire. Oh man, yeah. As well, so it took them. You know, they did sev they, several attempts till they were able to figure out what to do with that. Um, but yeah, wonderful ballpark. Um, Great city to play in, great fans. You know, I had nothing but positive things to say of my time in Seattle. 1997, you get to the playoffs for the first time, mm -hmm. and you make your first appearance. Walk me through the 97 season. And uh, well, I mean, again, it's when you win, it's magical. It really is. I mean, it's your group with the coaching staff and the organization, but – you know, the city backed us, the fan base backed us, and that, you know, I'll go to my grave saying that, you know, it's when you got a ballpark full of people um, screaming and hollering for you, it's uplifting. Mm -hmm. It's uplifting. And I was fortunate enough to go to the, the hockey game January 1st this year. Okay. To see a, so, yeah, to watch the Kraken play. Okay. And it brought back so many memories of 97 98 you know that that era of baseball with the mariners sold out stadium noise music excitement mm -hmm. you know and i i'm just kind of sitting there and like, wow this unfortunately this stadium hasn't seen a lot of that i mean the last couple of years the mariners have mm -hmm. done a lot better um but you know to get into that playoff situation and you know that's what it's about and uh you know 97 I mean, was phenomenal. You know, unfortunately, you know, when we got to the playoffs, we just seemed to fall short. You know, it was either we were a pitcher short, we were a hitter short, you know, in some fashion. And, and again, that comes back to that juggling act as, as a general manager and as an organization. Who do we add? How do we add? Because sometimes you have to look at, these types of situations and, and kind of understand those situations and say, okay, if we add, what are we bringing in? Is it going to detract from the situation mm -hmm. or is it going to make the situation better? And you don't, you really don't know. So again, and how do you know about the player or players you're bringing in, right? Are they in contract years? Are they playing banged up? Are they healthy? You know, I mean, there's a lot of factors. Or are they going to become a free agent? And if they're going to, will they fit into our, our salary structure? Are we going to rent a player? Mm -hmm. What are we giving away to get that player? 
right. right? There's a lot of variables that come into play, yeah. right? And again, as a gen, you know, and look, I, if you're a manager or general manager and you're making those decisions, I don't think you you can really. Per, you don't have a crystal ball to predict, and you can't worry about what people are going to think. If you're trying to do your best, and you've got the graces of the ownership, and you're adding, you think you're adding something to your club, then you know, I think you do it. Mm -hmm. Right, but you also sometimes, like I was starting to say, sometimes if you add, it detracts from the team based on the clubhouse. Exactly. Yeah. And that can be, you know, you know, a huge knife in the coffin. Mm -hmm. So now it becomes, you know, you, you're kind of on a roll. How's that going to work? Right. And sometimes your best trade is no trade. Mm hmm. Right. But then when you if you get fortunate enough to move on and you fall short, you go, oh, well, we should have, you know, they should have done the. You know, it's easy to second guess. Right. Right. And I'm not here to second guess anybody. You know, they were doing what they thought they should do. Um, but it was fun being a part of it. And it was that to me, the, those are the memories that are created. I mean, I, I mean, being in town, living, you know, I live not far out of town so that that feeling, that vibe, that uplifting, anywhere you went, you know, everybody was kind of walking on air. It mm -hmm. was the same way in Philadelphia when we won a World Series. It was, everybody had the colors on. The radio talk shows were nothing but positive. And mm -hmm. it was just, and people were excited to come to the ballpark. And to me, that was the cool part. That 116 win season in 2001, yeah. the record still stands. Yeah. What was it like um, to come to the ballpark every day in that it environment? Was, it was – the feeling was we're not going to lose. Yeah. And not in a cocky way, not in a brash way. We didn't know it. I mean, my recall of spring training was we had a very mediocre spring training. And towards the end of spring training, I, if I recall, we were I was on a trip to uh, Tucson – and we were playing horribly. And I can remember Lou pacing up and down the dugout. Now, this is spring training. <laughs> and, you know, using language that, you know, I can't use here. Um, but just like, you know, you can't turn it off. You can't, you know, just turn it off and turn it on. You know, we the season's a couple days away, blah, 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 you know. And then the season starts when, when, when win, lose, win, 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 you know, and, you know, in the beginning of the year, I've been, you know, there was one year when I was in Texas, I'm going to say it might have been my second year in Texas, we were like 11 and 1 or 12 and 3, you know, thinking, huh, this is a joke, you know, we're going to, you know, it's not hot yet, you know, a lot of things down there come into play, you know, so it's like, okay, let's Let's be respectful of this, right? The baseball mm -hmm. gods, you hear people talk about the baseball gods, you know, <laughs> they're going to get you and, you know, things even out. Oh, well, you know, we get through April and we're winning, right? You get into May, we're winning. And it didn't matter if we were down in a game, whether it was three, whether it was one, down to one out, or in the sixth inning, whatever it was, if we, whatever we needed, we went out and manufactured. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like, respectfully, you're kind of giggly. Like, <laughs> like that, it's going to happen did at that, some point. Did that just happen? Yeah. Did we just come back? Like, I feel like there was a game in, in uh, I don't know if it was 01 or not, but we had a game in Minneapolis where we were losing big. I believe we hit seven doubles in a row wow <laughs> like the stuff doesn't happen mm -hmm. right and i mean and you know i look back at that season and i th this is going to sound negative but i don't look at it as a negative we averaged to me it's my crazy left-handed way of looking at things we averaged seven losses a month that season we all know the big number, 116, mm -hmm. right? 
seven losses a month. That's, that's it's unheard of, mm-hmm. right? And the the great thing was, every player that had a uniform on that season made a large contribution. And that's what allowed us to do what we did. How were the uh, clubhouse vibes? Was everyone just buddy buddy that entire year to where everyone's um, having a good time? And yeah, you know what? And you know what? Rolling. Whether we won or we didn't lose, I don't know that. You know, when you say buddy buddy, I think most guys- of the clubhouses I've been in, people have gotten along. Mm-hmm. But in a clubhouse like that, when you're winning, there's a bounce. In people step when they come in the door, yeah. and I, I, I've explained it like this in the past, where we had a lot of, I'm going to say we had a lot of blue collar players, mm-hmm. and they'd open the clubhouse door, and even though there wasn't a time clock, and a, and a, a rack of hard hats, but that's kind of how I envision it. Mm-hmm. You took your time card out, you clocked in, you put it back, you went over to your hard hat, you put your hard hat on, and you went to work. Mm -hmm. And that's what guys did. And it was day after day after day after day. And, but again, it comes down to the personality. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, we won yesterday, so we got to go out and win again today. You get that taste in your mouth, Mm -hmm. and it's a good taste. So you're like, okay, we're getting it. This is how, this is how, and, and we just built off of it. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was magical. And like I said, if we were down in a game, didn't matter what part of the game, especially late in the game, we need three. We'll get. Let's get four. Oh, let's. <laughs> you know what? Let's get one more. Let's get five. Yeah. You know. And it, like you said, it wasn't in a cocky way. It wasn't in a brash way. You know, and guys are like, do you believe what's happening? Is this really happening? You know, like pinch me. Is this really happening? <laughs> so yeah, it was. Uh, it was magical, and you know, unfortunately, we didn't get deep into the playoffs that year. Mm-hmm. But here again, it comes back down to I'm not putting it on loose shoulders, but you play so well. I forget when it was we clinched, but I want to say, like, it was end of August, beginning of September. Okay, now you got another month to play. Right. Right. It was almost like. It hurt us to be that successful because now as a manager, what do you do? Because now, you know, common sense tells you, okay, well, I should keep playing my players, Mm -hmm. but what if he gets hurt? What if he gets tired? So now as a manager, you go, all right, I'm going to let this guy play, but I'm going to give him more days off, Mm -hmm. right? I want to rest him. So we're ready to go in the playoffs. Right. Right? So you, we, I, I feel like looking back, not necessarily being involved in the situation, I would not tell you in that moment that we lost our edge. But looking back on it, we may have lost our edge a little bit. Making a big change like right. that. Right. Well, it wasn't necessarily a change, yeah. but, I mean, you're just, you know, People Guys that out. play every day. They got out of their groove, maybe a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And I can't say they got complacent. I don't, I, there's no way there was complacency going on. There's a ton of excitement. But, you know, you know I look at things this way. Um, the year that when I was in, in 07, when I told you that the Rockies cut right through us, they swept us. If you recall, I forget who they played in the next round. They walked right over them, too. Right? So now they're going to the World Series. Mm -hmm. Who did they play? Boston. Well, Boston was in maybe it was uh, Boston, New York. If I'm not mistaken, I don't remember exactly. Either way, Boston had to keep playing and grind through that next round and then jump right into the World Series. They didn't have time to think about it. Mm Mm-hmm. Colorado, oh, we cut right through the Phillies. They're a pretty good team. Take a day off. We cut through the next, you know, they yeah. cut right through the next game. Now, they, I want to say they had four or five days okay. to stay sharp, right? You see it with college football in, in yeah, like know, a month the national championship, right? Yeah. 
you see it uh, in the NFL, right? That time. Well, look, when your body is used to doing something day after day after day, and now you, it changes. Like for me, I hated the all-star break. In the era that I played in, it was mostly three days. Towards the end of when I was playing, it became four days. Hated it. Because you can't replace what you've been doing every day if you go home. Even if you stay in the city you're playing in and try to work out, you're still not playing a game. Mm -hmm. So you kind of lose that that edge. And then you get back from the break, and it takes a couple days to kind of get, you know, you can't just, again, flip the switch. So I think that's kind of what happened to us. We got a little flat. And, you know, I, it, like what we did during that regular season was magical. But for us, for that 116 to really stand up, we would have needed to win the World Series. Then I think that 116 gets talked about a little bit more. And that team as a whole gets talked about a little bit more. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not all about... What you do in the regular season, right. it's about right. what you do well, in the postseason. Yeah, what, do, what have you done for me lately? Right. right? <laughs> yeah. What was it like playing for Lou? Loved it. We see My most favorite manager yeah. ever. He would be first, Charlie Manuel would be second, and they're really close. Um, but two different personalities, two different types of people, but both wonderful baseball people. Lou was passionate about winning. Um I describe Lou as having another teammate on the team. He cared about winning, and he cared about you as a player. Every one of his players. Now, he was hard on you. Mm -hmm. If you weren't pulling your end, he could be, especially with your pitcher, he could be really hard on you. But it wasn't because he didn't like you or he disliked you. It's because you weren't doing your job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I kind of... Kind of look at that, you know, I look at his history, where he came from, and where he played and coached, and that was with the Yankees. And, you know, they there was an expectation, especially when Mr. Steinbrenner was running that show, mm -hmm. right? And as a player and as a coach, we've seen, you know, the, the stuff, the run-ins that he's had with, you know, with players, with, with managers, um, and I think Lou kind of, that kind of cr helped create Lou to, to who he was as a manager. Mm -hmm. And he brought that to our organization. He was passionate, passionate, but respectful. And the cool thing, I, w one of the cool things I enjoyed with him was that, um, well, there's two. One, approachable, always approachable. Um whether it was in his office, on the bench, wherever it might be. But there's a guy, if you talk to him and you were asking about yourself, be prepared because you may hear something you don't want to hear, right? <laughs> but the other cool thing was he was bilingual. Really? Yeah. So he would, ob he would obla with the Latin guys wow. fluently, which I thought was really cool. I think that's uh, it's a special... Uh, trait that some people have and uh, I you know when you have uh, Latins on a team you know I, I, I put it this way if I ever had to go to Japan and play or a Latin American country to play and don't know the language and nobody speaks my language it's really hard that's another threshold that you have to get over mm -hmm. now when the manager can talk to you I think it, it's really it, it's it, massive. It, it 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 brings a certain kind of calmness or a comfort. It allows a comfortability, right? Mm -hmm. And I you know I've played with a, a fair amount of Latin players that preferred could speak some broken English, but preferred to speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. So to have that rapport with your manager, I think was was very cool. And like you said, thirdly, again he was passionate. Mm -hmm. passionate maybe that should go first very passionate about winning he cared he cared but he, he cared about his players too was it one of those things to where he might blow up in the moment but then after the game he talks yeah. to you again yeah. and he's like hey well a lot of times it wasn't necessary i mean sometimes it was after the game but it might be the next day it might be two days later mm -hmm. it may be during batting practice um you know it wasn't like 
you're getting called into the principal's office. Yeah. I mean, that, I don't know that that, unless there was something major going on, I never had that, but I was comfortable enough when necessary, and I did it on two different occasions where I went to him, went in his office and asked him to talk, and you know, the feedback that I got was wonderful. And I didn't take it personal because I had some of those, like I said, I had some of those experiences previously in my career and some of them I took personally but I learned how to deal with it and I learned that he wasn't he wasn't coming after me he was giving his opinion and his opinion was spot on even though he never pitched an inning in his life <laughs> so I was getting it from a hitter's perspective okay and that's how I took it and it was it was wonderful and it I was struggling at the time one of them was in Candlestick Park uh, where I went into his office and had a conversation with him. And he's, he looked at me and he said, you're not throwing your changeup enough. And my changeup wasn't good at that point in time. And it just so happened that uh, that day I threw a bullpen. And I probably threw 60 or 70 changeups in that bullpen and continued to work on it. And my next start, it all came back. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man. You're smart, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I yeah, I, and it, it, last summer I happened to bump into him at the All Star Game. It was great to see him. I hadn't seen him in many years. So um, yeah, we had a lot of a lot of fun conversation. And then on top of that, it sounds like Lou was giving you some pitching advice. I assume that you had pitching coaches throughout yep. your career. Yep. That would. Would they give you the, the advice to the pitch usage, the percentages? Uh, the no, 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 that wasn't that percentages wasn't and stuff like that. Pitch usage, maybe. Um, for me, a lot of it was with my pitching coaches, it was mechanical, uh, mechanical things, because I was a very mechanical kind of guy. I was very visual. I needed to see it, uh, or I needed to see hitters' reactions to it. As a young player, I didn't understand that. As an older player, it, it kind of clicked for me. Uh, but, you know, my very first pitching coach, his name was Bill Ballou. It was a short season A ball team. He was a college some, uh, college coach, pitching coach, and he did it as a summer job. I mean, he helped me as much mm -hmm. as some of my major league pitching coaches. You know, mm -hmm. right place at the right time kind of thing. Um, but it's that rapport that you build, that respect, that give and take kind of respect that you have for those people and the time and the effort that they put in and the caring that they that they have for you and your pitching staff. Um, uh, boy, I can't think of his name. Um, Dick Bosman, Mike Flanagan when I, in Baltimore um, were very beneficial to me. Um, Brian Price in Seattle, Dick Pohl, uh, who I, I'm still friends with. Um, Dick Pohl uh, pitched for Seattle, actually the Pilots, I believe. Uh, but I had him as a minor league pitching coach with the Cubs. Uh, had him for a short bit as a big league pitching coach with the Cubs. Um, he went on. He became one of du he's one of Dusty's best friends. So he was a pitching coach for Dusty for many many years. Uh, he he was a pitching coach in Cleveland as well. Uh, got along really well with Dick. Another guy told it like it was. Black was black, white was white. It was, you know, it was right in front of you. But you know, he he, you know, he'd get in my grill when I when, but I understood why. And uh, and it was never really motivational. It was just about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Dick was hard. You know, even <laughs> if you you know in the minor leagues, you kept the pitching chart bef the night before you pitched, and he either had a clicker. Or he'd count in his head the pitches. And, you know, like the third inning, he'd say, hey, Moye, how many pitches you got? Oh, I got 37. You're off by two. It's 39. Fix it. You know, I mean, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, or if you came back at the end of the game and you had to total everything up and your totals didn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't accept the chart. Go back and figure it out. So, I mean, things like that, little discipline things. You're not paying attention. You missed a pitch here. That kind of stuff, or you throw in a bullpen and you say, "Hey, the other day, why did you throw that curveball?" You remember that? You know that kind of stuff. I mean, it's it gets you thinking. 
Yeah. I, I, hey, I'm, I, I need to pay more attention here. I need to be a little more astute to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So um, Stan Williams, uh, we had him for a short bit in, in Seattle. Older, older gentleman, um, came from a different era, but uh, I enjoyed him for the short time we had him. Uh, Nardi Contreras, Bobby Cuellar was the first pitching coach I had in Seattle. Um, you know, he got, at times, he got a bum rap from, from Lou, uh, but Lou had to take it out on somebody when we weren't throwing enough <laughs> strikes or pitching well or consistently. Um, you know, he'd get on our bullpen guys, um, and Bobby Cuellar, you know, he, he took it. Uh, Nardi Contreras was another guy, uh, different style of pitching coach, but, you know, he had some Brian Price. He had never had any major league experience, became the pitching coach in Seattle, and he's now the, still the, he's a pitching coach in um, San Francisco right now. Um, he went on to manage. He worked with the Phillies. Um, I still keep in touch with Brian. Um, uh, Rich Doobie in Philadelphia, uh, another guy that, you know, had a lot of you know, great experiences with and a lot of fun with, too. I mean, it's it's not all just work. Mm -hmm. It's it's some fun stuff too. Yeah. So yeah, it's just and you know, you look back and it's like, wow, these guys are really played really important roles uh, to their job and in, in, in my career. 